Hello, everyone, and welcome again to our session on anxiety, part three, uh, when concern becomes obsessive. In part one, we uh, took some time to define what exactly is anxiety. In part two, we looked at the, the nature of anxiety or what is at the heart of anxiety. And today, in part three, we want to take some time and look at how we can offer some help. As you can imagine, the whole subject of anxiety is quite vast, and, and I know there's complexities that we, we don't have time to really address, but I want to get right to a, a passage that's perhaps very common to, to many of us, and we often go there, and that's in Philippians chapter 4. And typically, we look at uh, Philippians 4, 6, and uh, we start there with the um, command, as it were, or the imperative that says, be anxious for nothing. And that's an interesting place to start, but as, as we know as students of God's Word, it's always important to consider the context. And I think it's very important, even as we're helping people, uh, looking at their anxiety and getting help uh, to understand the full context of Philippians chapter 4 and how we use that in a counseling context. So, I want to start really in, in, in verse 5. We're going to read through that and then uh, comment on that on, a, on an approach. I'm going to give a little paradigm here of how we can help an individual. So Philippians 4, 5 uh, through 9, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of uh, good repute, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, the things you have heard and learned and received and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Wow, it's loaded. Good insight, good counsel, good perspective, good things that will help somebody dealing with anxiety. Certainly the goal is peace. Because as we learned, uh, the, the word anxiety has a lot to do with tearing apart. Certainly not very peaceful. So what is our, our paradigm here? Our paradigm here is right praying, with thanksgiving, right thinking, the mind of Christ, and right living by faith. That's where we're headed to today. But I don't want to make this comment. A few minutes ago I said it, uh, it's important to consider the, the context of a passage. So whatever passage that we, we choose is very important. You'll notice that I began with verse 5 because sometimes we leave that out. And we park on the idea of, of being anxious for nothing. And that's important. And that indeed is a, is a command. But this command is in the context of a promise. And that's really important to understand. God did not just, you know, in, in the inspiration of his word, inspire Paul to, to just get after people. But instead, this command is preceded by an important promise. The Lord is near be anxious for nothing. Well, that sets a whole different context, doesn't it? I was reminded of this. I'm a grandfather. I have seven grandchildren, and I was, grand, I was babysitting one of my grandkids. Uh, I was two years old at the time, uh, and they all referred to me as Poppy. But he woke up in the middle of the... It was early in the evening, but he woke up in the middle of his sleep with a nightmare, and he was crying. And I went into his room where he was sleeping, uh, and I said, what's the matter, Jet? What, what, what happened? Uh, Poppy, I had a nightmare. And so what I did was I said, stop being afraid. Be anxious for nothing and go back to bed. No, <laughs> of course I didn't say that. I would be a terrible grandfather. Instead, I said to him, Jet, it's okay. Poppy is here. I'll stay back till you go to sleep. You don't have to be afraid. I think, that's, I think that's kind of the, uh, the, the tone, even in this passage. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be anxious. Why? 
because God promised to be near. So everything that we are going to say from this point forward is set in that context. The promise of God's presence is why he tells us not to be afraid. That's very important. That's something to really get across in the hearts and lives of the people that we're trying to encourage. Because sometimes we just see, well, stop worrying. And that's not good counsel. <laughs> I'm sure that you, know, you wouldn't give that kind of counsel, but sometimes we were tempted. Sometimes our counsel comes across that way. So what do we mean here? Right praying with thanksgiving. Notice it says, be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Here's an important prepositional phrase, with thanksgiving. You see, prayer without thanksgiving is like a bird without wings. It's not going to get very far. Thanksgiving is very important. Why? If we believe the scriptures, we can be thankful even for the problems. And right away, one of the things that we want to thank God for is the fact that he is present. God, I, I, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm thankful that you are present before me. Thankfulness helps to calm the heart. Why? Because thankfulness causes us to focus on the previous promises fulfilled by God. God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful in the past that by your grace, I was allowed to, to walk through some things and I was able to get on the other side. Based on that, I am thankful to you. See, thankfulness requires us to intentionally think of God's faithfulness in the past. And that causes us to have confidence about our present situation. We may not be able to appreciate the circumstances that we are in, but we can believe that God has everything under control and that he will use everything that happens for our good because we've seen him do that in the past. It is for this power that we can always be thankful. It's for this grace that we can always be thankful. And if you notice on the screen, anxiety and thankfulness reflects the focus of our hearts. You see, anxiety focuses on what I don't have. God, what if this? And what if I don't? And what if this? And what if Thanksgiving focuses on what I do have? And that is God himself, his presence. Anxiety focuses on what could happen. Those scary what ifs, right? Thanksgiving focuses on God's promises. But I promise never to leave you nor forsake you. Anxiety focuses on myself. I can't control this. And I, what if this happens to me and I can't, I can't do this and I can't do that? But Thanksgiving focuses on God and even others. Thankfulness causes us to remember what God has done for us in the past, which gives us confidence in handling the future. So right praying involves thankfulness. You know, that's an important question to ask in counseling, by the way. People say, you know, oftentimes, well, what have you, you know, when you ask the question, well, what have you done with your anxiety? Well, I've prayed. And then a lot of times, but nothing happened. A question that I like to ask oftentimes is, how have you prayed? Sometimes that reveals even what they think about God and what they expect from God. So our first paradigm to help somebody is to help them with their prayer life, right praying. That's the advice that God gives in Philippians 4, in Philippians 4, 6 in particular, 4, 6, and 7. And then secondly, notice right thinking, right thinking. What do we mean by that? That is having the mind of Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, pure, lovely, good, of good repute, excellence, the things that are worthy of praise dwell. And you know what that word means? It, it literally means park your mind on this or marinate your brain <laughs> in, in these things. See, we have a tendency not to do that. We have a tendency to video loop what I call wild imaginings. I'll be the first to admit I'm guilty of that. I'm worrying. Um, it, it's kind of anxiety. Uh, that just gets carried away with, 
with, with the what ifs. And I call them wild imaginings. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about what, the, um, what Paul talks about in, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, making every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, having the mind of Christ, taking the what ifs and making them captive into what we know of the person of Christ and the work of Christ in our life. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that anxiety is a spiritual battle? I think most of us would agree it is. Where do, sp where do, spiritual, battle, uh, where do spiritual battles wage? Where do they wage their warfare? Right, in the mind. In the mind. Notice, too, in this passage, it's not that we are to avoid thinking about our circumstances, thinking about our concerns. That's not, that's not necessarily what he's saying. And it's good sometimes to do something to, to distract us. That's, that can be helpful. But that's not the ultimate goal because sometimes the distractions don't work, right? It's not, it's not so much that we avoid thinking about them, but here's the difference. We think about them in the right way with the mind of Christ. Go back to your what ifs. The what ifs need to be answered with the right what is true what is honorable, what is lovely, what is of a good repute. Is there any excellence? Is there any praise? Go back to those what ifs and filter them through things that are right, that are accurate, things that are honorable, that are excellent. In fact, we'll, we'll make a, a resource available to you, a counseling resource of taking these what ifs and taking them through the grid of Philippians 4, 8 here. So what do we allow our mind to video loop? What is true, honorable, fair, pure, acceptable, commendable? The intensity of the hurt? The what ifs? You see, it takes something being, someone being very intentional to, because that's the idea of making every thought captive. It's intentional. Every thought. Because every thought uh, sooner or later collects into a series of thoughts that form an attitude. An attitude about ourselves, about others, our circumstances, even God. So one of the things that I challenge people is put your confidence in God and doubt your fears. Put your confidence in God and doubt your fears. Because your fears are mere speculations. But when you bring God into the picture, it helps us to doubt our fears. So, think about it this way. Learn to doubt your fears, not what God has said. So, what if God was not in control? What if God were not good? What if God was not with you? What if God was truly Punishing you. That's where we go with the what is. Maybe God's punishing me. What if God was not merciful? What if God required perfection without grace? Some of our anxiety is that we think God somehow isn't pleased with us. Well, he's pleased with us because we have Christ. What if God did not love you? What if God were not just? What if there is no God? See, that would be reason for panic. But of course, we all realize that that's not true. God is in control. God is good. God is with us. There is no condemnation, condemnation for them that are in Christ. God is rich in mercy and grace. God does not require perfection. We are identified in the full righteousness of Christ. What if God did not love you? He does love you more than you can imagine. He gave his son to prove that he loves you. What if God were not just? We know he's just. The perfect blending of justice and mercy was meted out in the cross of Jesus Christ. And we know there is a God. So, 
as we process things, we don't want to become practical atheists. What is that? That's a Christian who attempts to understand the pain and the suffering without, under, without understanding who God really is. In other words, we leave God out of the picture. So when we're panicking, when we're, when we're going through the what ifs, we need to insert a very important conjunction, but God. The situation may seem hopeless. It may seem very despairing. It may seem out of control, but we need to insert an important phrase, but God. What is it that I know about God that brings me hope and understanding into this situation? But God. Life stinks sometimes, doesn't it? It really does. But God is not life. That's really important to understand. God is not life. Not in the lower case of the spelling of life. He is life, capital L, but not life, lowercase l. Life does stink. Too often people try and interpret God through the, through the lens of the horrible tragedies or the difficulties that they're going through. And they say, well, if I'm going through this, God is not good. We got it backwards. We want to we wanna instead reverse that. And instead of, instead of coming up, um, interpreting God through the difficulties of life, instead, we want to we wanna take our knowledge of God and then interpret our circumstances. See the difference? See, that's right thinking. And thirdly, right living. What are we talking about? Living by faith. Let's face it. Some of our fears and anxieties are caused by our own choices. Or some of the choices we make after a bad thing happens. We're both sufferers and sinners. Sometimes, even though suffering comes, at, it wasn't necessarily our fault. But now our coping mechanisms become sinful. And we complicate life even more. Faulty coping systems or escapes that end up becoming even sinful habits. And complicating our life even more. Sometimes even hurting ourselves. Sometimes counselees engage in self-harm as a way of trying to relieve maybe guilt or, uh, or, or, or having some sense of control. But it doesn't last, does it? That relief doesn't last. Remember, trust is about surrendering control. Do you believe God is trustworthy? Does he have your best interest in mind? Is he good? Is he wise? Is he merciful? Is he compassionate? So trust actually is connected to this idea of faith. Right living is about living by faith. What am I talking about? In other words, do you believe what God has said? You see, that's what, if God said it, do I trust it to be true? And if I trust it to be true, I'm going to live by it. That's living by faith. We can put it another way. Notice the screen. Faith is my response to what God has said is true, in which me, the believer, amend my thoughts, my feelings, and actions in favor of what God says is true. If God said this, do I believe it's true? If it's true, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think in ways that make it true. That's going to impact how I feel, and it's certainly going to impact how I live day to day. And we could define walking by faith this way. Walking by faith is now doing what I know is right in spite of how I feel. Because even though I know something is right, those, those crazy emotions scream louder than anything else, don't they? If that's the case, then I'm going to do what I know is right in spite of how I feel. Then I'm going to experience God's peace. Notice what it says there. When you do these things, then the peace of God is with you. Verse 9. Peace that an anxious person pursues is preceded only by obedience. 
Friends, let me say a word to you. If even right now you are the one who has or is experiencing feelings of anxiety and, and panic, let me share something encouraging. That familiar enemy that arises from your, your own heart, which is most distressful, whether it's real and, and, and sometimes we don't even know where it comes from, right? Maybe you just found out about a serious diagnosis for you or for somebody that's very close to you. Maybe someone is bullying you, intimidating you. Maybe there is a lot of uncertainties about your future. Maybe, maybe there's some past guilt and shame that's part of this nagging anxiety that you're always looking back over your shoulder. If I could say one thing, just as one thing to always remember, and it's this. No matter how isolated you might think your experience is, or how strong and intense fear or anxiety might feel, the reality is this, and I, and I trust that this, you'll, you'll wrap yourself around this reality, you're not alone. There is someone who describes himself in words that says, I will never Never, never leave you, nor forsake you. Never, never, you are not alone. It's not as though hearing that is like some kind of magical uh, thing. No, not at all. However, it is one of those things that gets worked into our hearts more effectively during moments when we're not feeling anxious. So I would encourage you to meditate often on the fact that you're not alone. What does it mean to be in the presence of God? It's the reality on which you can build your life. God always seems to comfort his people, most often with his presence. No matter, the biblical writers, when Jesus came to this world, called him Emmanuel, God with us. And as believers, we have the promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us. May you be comforted in that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I trust this has been hopeful uh, for you um, in helping other people who struggle with anxiety. We want to let you know of a number of resources that are available and if you go to our website, uh, you'll find a number of great resources for helping people with anxiety. But I want to do this. We realize that this is just a starting point, And there are many aspects to anxiety that we're not able to address in our three-part three series. But I want to make known to you two resources uh, by Dr. Ed Welch. One of them is Running Scared. You notice it up on the screen, a very thorough working of fear and anxiety, a good, solid um, theology of fear, as it were, theology of anxiety. He, he, he brings a solid biblical case in dealing with fear and understanding fear. And also another resource, When I'm Afraid. It's a workbook. It's a great study guide to work with with somebody side by side studying together this issue of fear and anxiety. So again, be sure to check the link for many other recommended resources on this very important subject of anxiety when concerns become obsessive. It's been great being with you. Hope to see you again. God bless. I'm glad that you completed this series on anxiety. I trust that it's been a blessing to you and to those to who you minister. Did you know that Learn the Word Video Courses is one of a family of resources under the Learn the Word brand? We also have a podcast and we have a publishing house, all devoted to helping provide you with resources to learn the word. You can learn more by visiting learn.wool.org or go to the description and find links there. Also, do you know a young person that would benefit from studying God's Word one to two years of intensive Bible study. We would love to invest in their lives and help them to become more effective to serve the Lord for the rest of their lives. You can visit us at wordoflife.edu 
or go into the description and see the links provided there. Until next time, make it your ambition to learn the word.